Hi, Ange. Uh, tough one, Brighton. And then all the, a lot of the players going off on international duty. Have you had a chance to strangle, explode at them yet after that? Uh, yeah, look, um, I was speaking uh, metaphorically, uh, as you can see, because I'm here, I haven't exploded. And uh, um, yeah, look, it's one of those where you, you kind of, as much therapy as anything else, just get things off your chest. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it's about giving the right sort of feedback. Um, the emotion of what you're feeling straight after the game is obviously, um, you know, dissipated 10 days later. But um I said it's important that the players get the appropriate feedback for what was, uh, you know, a real sort of um, difficult game for us because we, as well as we did in the first half, we were really poor in the second half. During the break, there was um, talks with Van der Lecht and Ryan Mason potentially going there. It, it didn't happen. Can we, can we get more on that and how pleased are you that he's still here? Yeah, look, I um, there wasn't too much in it, but, uh, you know, I... I I've always worked on the premise that, you know, part of my role is also, you know, developing coaches and um, something I take great pride in. And Ryan's obviously someone who sees himself, you know, one day taking that opportunity. And, you know, it's obviously uh, a really important decision for the guys and, and it's not like, you know, we want them to leave. And certainly um, with Ryan, um, he's doing a great job for us here, but... At the same time, I think if it's something that they want to explore, I think it's important they do that because it, it confirms one thing or another for them in their head about you know where they're currently at and whether it's the right job for them. So, um, but yeah, you know, to be fair, Ryan, he was he was pretty straightforward with it, and the only thing I said to him, look, I didn't want it drawn out, taking any time, and he didn't. And he's you know he's really happy where he is now and committed to us. I know how much you value the importance of international football, being a former Australia head coach yourself. Obviously, the news this week, Thomas Tuchel is now the England head coach. You've managed in Japan. You're proud of being there. You've managed in Scotland. You love it there. I know how much you love London. One day, would you consider being a national manager of England <laughs> or, or, or elsewhere, non, non-Australia? Come on. Well, look, I... One, um, day. one day. Yeah, one day. Um, I, look, I, from my perspective, like I said, I enjoyed international football, but I felt, um, you know, there was a... By the end of it, I was really keen to get back into the day and day in day out of club football, and um, it's where I kind of I'm really passionate about. But you know, in the future, who knows? Um, and and yeah, you know, I think so. Yeah, you know, you, you kind of I do feel an attachment to, to certain nations that I've I've worked in, so it wouldn't be exclusive to you know to, to Australia. Probably, in fact, I wouldn't coach the you know, Australian national team again because I've, I've kind of done that. So, um, but. Look, uh, it is it is a real uh, it's a different role. There's there's greater responsibility because you know there's there's a whole sort of nation's expectations around uh, that position, and you feel that. Um, but hugely enjoyable as well. Hi, Ange. You said you gave the appropriate feedback to your players after the Brighton game. What was that feedback? What kind of reaction do you want to see tomorrow? Yeah, look, I think by appropriate, I mean you know you can't just dismiss what happened in the first half and just focus on the second half. I mean, it'd be different if it was a, a really poor performance all round. Uh, then you've, you've kind of, you, you, not an easier, but the yeah, analysis can be fairly straightforward. But, you know, kind of the, the question is why we were so good in the first half and so poor in the second half. And, 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 and the second half was more around that just didn't look anything like ourselves. We were really passive um, with and without the ball. We we kind of, we lack real conviction and, and courage in everything we did. It's almost like we felt like we'd done enough and I hadn't seen that before in us and it's it's a good lesson for, for the whole group um, that, you know, you need to, you know, make sure that irrespective of how a game is going that you kind of stick to the, the core principles of, of your football and... Um, you know, it's a, it's a timely reminder for us that, uh, you know, particularly in a, in a game of football when you haven't put, and really in the first half we should have finished the game off, that when you don't, um, it's very easy for momentum to shift. Tomorrow will be West Ham's fifth London derby in the Premier League this season, but this is the one that means the most to their fans. Are you aware of this rivalry and the significance of it? Yeah, no, I was made very aware of it last year and, um, you know, what it means and... Uh, yeah, important game. Um, yeah, we, uh, yeah, last year we played really well, but didn't end up winning uh, 
here at home, it was kind of the, the tail of our sort of that part of our season a little bit. But um, it's going to be a challenging game. They've got some fantastic players in the team. Obviously, they've got a new manager. They're, they're doing things a little bit differently. Um, you know, we saw in the last game just what a threat they can be, particularly going forward. And um, good challenge for us. But I think um, the emphasis has to be on us reproducing the form you know we've shown in recent times. And I said more importantly, sticking to the principles of our game. You mentioned the new manager, Julian Lopetegui, was singing your praises yesterday. What do you think of him? Yeah, I mean, you know, you just have to look at sort of the positions he's held and, and that gives you a fairly clear idea of how highly he's regarded and the impact he's made. Um, you know, you don't, you don't become sort of manager of Spain or, or Real or the jobs he's held. Um, and, you know, I'm always interested when, when, when managers come in and, and sort of try and take a club in a new direction. Obviously, they're trying to... You know, play a little bit differently and um, it's not easy to do uh, so you're kind of I'm always intrigued by, by managers who kind of take that path and uh, yeah he's look he's a top quality coach and uh, I think um, you know I think he's starting to build sort of the team that he wants at West Ham and um, yeah I think it'll be exciting for the supporters thank you hi Ange how are you I'm good mate um didn't meet didn't beat West Ham last season in either game drew at West Ham and despite being actually dominant at home and the first half lost at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. But this will be a very different West Ham team. You mentioned already the new manager likes to play in a very different way. Will that suit the way you like to play? No, not necessarily. I mean, I, you know, I think it, it is a different approach, but um, most of the personnel is still there from, from last year when you look at sort of the, the kind of lineups they've had the last uh, two or three weeks. So, you know, there's still... You know, that emphasis that they had last year, I mean, they're, they're a big side, they're a physical side, they've got some real speed on the wing. So um, I don't think it's a style that suits us or doesn't suit us. I think when we when we play well, we can play well against most systems and styles, as we've shown. Um, and if we don't or if we don't stick to our principles, we can struggle against anybody. So I think more important for us is how we approach things. Going back to the Thomas Tuchel appointment as England manager, first of all, did you or were you surprised that... A top football nation like England couldn't come up with an English coach? No, I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, obviously they they were looking for somebody to replace uh, Gareth, who'd done an unbelievable job and, um, you know, I guess like most things, they, they, they probably canvassed, you know, who was the most uh, appropriate for, for the role now. Um, you know, I think yeah, there's some very, very good English coaches around. Uh, but, you know, with national team jobs, it's not always straightforward, you know. It's about timing sometimes. Um, I certainly found that when I was when I became an you know, Australian national team bo jo boss. It was a good time for me and a good time for them to look for an Australian. And I was doing well at the time and I could get out of where I was. Um, it's not always the case, so things have to align. But I think they've got a fantastic manager in Thomas. Um, he's got an outstanding record, particularly in kind of knockout football and... Um, Again, highly respected and great group of players they've got at the moment who are just beginning to sort of emerge, um, you know, on a global basis. So, um, exciting appointment. And having done the international football management already, um, is there more scrutiny on a manager at international level or at club level? I mean, certainly with, with England, you think it would probably be a bit higher than Australia with respect. And, I mean, for example, you never asked for Australia whether you'd sing the national anthem or not. We've already asked Thomas Tuchel. I don't know if you'd seen the national anthem, you England manager. There's a lot of questions in there, mate. Um, <laughs> let me get ahead around all of it. Um, look, I, I get, yeah, there is a lot more scrutiny in the England national team manager's role, absolutely. More than probably any other role anywhere in the football universe, I'd say, uh, from living here. And, and it's funny how, you know, there's this clamour for an English manager, but I'm not sure. Paul, I'm not sure you guys have treated English managers really kindly in the past. Uh, it's not like they get extra support by being English and, and, and managing their national team. Just looking at the history, and again, I'm I'm looking at it from afar. So, um, you know, I think whoever you know, whenever an Englishman does take this role, it, it, I certainly felt as you know when I was you know manager of Australia, th there is a greater weight on your shoulders because it is your nation and. You're always going to live there, you know. It's like sometimes with the foreigners, you know, they can do the job, and if it's not what great, they go back and live where they live, and they don't have to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis, you know. Whereas 
So there is a greater weight of responsibility when it's your own national team. I, I really believe that, um, and particularly the England national team. So, I mean, that's something that I think probably the you know, the people who make these appointments are wary of. Is it's not just about coaching; it's how you deal with all these other things that are attached to the England national team job. And and sometimes the foreign coaches don't probably have to deal with it as much as as an English manager would. So, um, you know, there's there's a real challenge there. But um, like I said, I think they've they've you know, they've got an outstanding manager in Thomas and um, I think the key thing is irrespective, they've got a fantastic generation of players coming through. Um, you know, I'd be excited if I was an England football supporter. Hi, and Jim. I wanted to ask you a bit more about this uh, England manager's position. Um, there's been a lot of de- debate about the calibre of English coaches in, in English football. I was wondering what you thought of that, you know, with a lot of English coaches in your backroom staff. Do you think that... English coaches are, are of the highest calibre and, and what are the barriers for them to get opportunities? Yeah, look, I, look, there are, absolutely. I mean, you know, even in the Premier League, you know, you look at Eddie and even guys like Steve Cooper who've done a great job with the England underage teams, which is always a good indicator about international football. So, you know, there, there's, there's a, there are fantastic English managers there, but oh, I've just never looked at, it, at coaches from, a you know, and their nationality is really doesn't really interest me you know it's about how they work and you know how passionate they are about what they do it's a tough job how they deal with things um, and you know I think part of the growth comes from being open to allowing you know different kinds of you know um, cultures and, and nationalities into your game I don't think the Premier League would be the best competition in the world if, if it was restricted you know in terms of the access we've got some fantastic footballers, some fantastic managers, which I think helps the game grow here. And, and I don't think it necessarily should stunt, you know, the growth of, you know, English players. It certainly hasn't started the growth of English players because you're getting some of the best English players coming through. Um, and I don't think it should stunt the growth of, of the English managers either. Um, if anything, hopefully raises their level, raises their uh, ambitions, uh, challenges them even more, I think. I've always, I've always you know, prescribed to the theory that, you know, you're kind of... You always pitch it to the highest common denominator and get everyone to sort of climb to that rather than sort of bring things down just to create opportunities for someone. Yeah, the player comparison's interesting there, how, how we have a lot of players like that, but do you think that maybe um, managers should look like the players to go overseas a little bit? You did that with Japan and, and Ryan obviously had the interview with Bel- in Belgium, so do you think that that's actually maybe a pathway that should be explored by more Englishmen if they're not getting the chances here? Yeah, I, I, I certainly... You know, subscribe to that theory. I think it it does it, it it allows you to grow. Sometimes, you know, when you've just had a real sort of siloed kind of journey of, you know, the same kind of culture, same kind of football. It, it, it you know, f- for there to be growth, you really almost have to go out and discover it yourself. Whereas when you do, when you when you manage overseas, and you know, there's been great examples. Bobby Robson did it. So Bobby did it. You know, Terry Venables did it. You know, some. England managers who, you know, Roy Hodgson did it, um, Graham Potter's done it, and, you, can, you know, they're all world-class coaches. So there is some merit in it, um, and it's not easy because I think sometimes there's a fear that if, if you do go overseas that you you get lost to the system here, um, whereas if you stay in the system, eventually you'll, you'll get... But um, I, I, I always think that part of growth as a, as a manager is to try and experience as many different things as possible and... Um, yeah, you know, coaching abroad certainly does that. Um, hi, Ange. I just wanted to ask about Jed Spencer's new contract and the journey that he's been on since he came back to the club this summer. Yeah, look, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think I mean, I've said a couple of days ago and I'll consistently say, most of a player's future is in their own hands, you know. it's It's not really... They're as much as in control of that as anyone else. I think sometimes footballers forget that, you know. They and, and with Jed, it could have been easy for him to come in this year, go out alone again, and see what you know. But it seemed that when he came into pre-season, he was determined to to make a career, you know, here for himself here at Tottenham and, and try and have a crack here rather than just wait to be loaned out. And you know, he, had, he did everything right at training. His attitude was great. You know, he's, he's a good footballer. I think the way we play suits him, and you know, he's. He's knuckled down to that, and he's you know he's earned himself a, a, a spot on the roster in our squad, and, and you know 
the rest is up to him again, you know, because it's an easy decision for me to make when I see that. Um, um, like I said, sometimes footballers think that, you know, they're, their fate is in other people's hands, you know, for the most part, it's in their own, you know. If they're doing well and if they're doing everything right, the future tends to take care of itself, whether that's, you know, where you currently are, you move on, but, you know, um, and Jed's certainly done that. If I've done my research properly, Tottenham have not played a single goal kick long this season. Um, so just wanted to ask if you could just explain why it is so important to you that players always look to pass it short. Um... Yeah, I don't know. We might have played one or two longer, um, but I'll, I won't second guess your research. Um, yeah, look, I, I, it's it's part of sort of the way we want to play our football. I think a shorter pass, there's more certainty you're going to start off with possession. We don't want to really give away possession. I think with the kind of team we are, we want to try and sort of set things up where we have control position of the game. And I think a shorter pass kind of guarantees that. And then from there, you, you, you move your way forward. Um, and, you know, it's... It's, it's a big part of sort of our build-up plays to try and, you know, manipulate oppositions as much as we can um, as we move up the park rather than just sort of, you know, go long to, to a contested ball and, and hope we get the second ball. We're just not that kind of team. So, um, but within that context, I think, you know, there's, there's enough variety there that we, we still make it sort of difficult for teams to, to, to kind of stop us from, from achieving that. Hi Ange, uh, you mentioned in your injury update yesterday that some players were still waiting to come back into yeah. the building. Yeah. Christian Romero played the early hours of Wednesday morning, had the long flight back. A bit of a quicker turnaround this time. Yeah. How is he? Yeah, he's okay. He's good, yeah. No, we got everyone back uh, yesterday. The last of them was, um, yeah, Christian and uh, Pape and Biss, and, and they're all good. Um, they've reported well. Um, yeah, look, we got the early kickoff, so that's a, a quick turnaround. But uh, we trained this morning and... They're all fine. Um, Lucas Bergvall picked up a small knock, but he trained as well, so he's he's no problem. Um, so, in terms of um, yeah, the, the internationals, um, yeah, everyone's got a clean bill of health. With Richarlison hopefully back in the squad tomorrow, what have you done differently over the past six weeks or so, just to make sure these injuries stop reoccurring? Yeah, we just we've taken our time with him, but it hasn't been just about sort of. Um, him recuperating and, and sort of recovering from the injury. We've, we've tried to use it to, to really kind of build his real fitness base up so that when he comes back, he, and it, it is in great, to be fair to him, he's, he's worked awfully hard. He's, you know, he's, he's trimmed down. He's, he's you know, he, he looks really lean now and, and he's worked really hard. So, you know, we've tried to use it almost as a, you know, another sort of pre-season for him on an individual basis to, to not just get him to recover from his injury, but also, because to be fair, he probably recovered from his injury a couple of weeks ago, but we've used the last couple of weeks of just getting his fitness base up and, and like, like I said, getting him really in a good physical condition so that we don't keep going through this cycle of him coming back and breaking down. And um, like I said, I mean, hopefully everything's good, but you know, to be fair to him, he's worked really hard and he's looking really good. He's had a good week of training. He's, um, you know, he's misplaying. He's a real kind of, you know, infectious guy as well. It's just good to have him back with the group. We'll finish this section with George. Hi, and um, just wanted to go back to QT Romero. Has he sort of hit the levels that you want this season or, or is he kind of still working his way to his best because he had a busy summer again, didn't he, with the Cop American mm. and a quick turnaround? Yeah, I think um, qt has been, I think, again, probably reflective of our season. You know, he's... he's He's, he's had some really good moments for us and then um, yeah, he's had a couple of disappointing moments for him, which I know he's been, you know, he has been happy about himself. Um, but it is tough, you know. I, we've spoken about the schedules and, you know, it's funny how the guys who didn't have international commitments, not that there were many of them, you know, look really refreshed and, you know, really ready to go and some, of, not just for us, but for football in general. And, um, you know, the amount of travel and the amount of games, because he always plays, um, Keith, he does. You know, we've always got to sort of bear that in mind, and um, you know, it's it's something that the players need to sort of learn to cope with the best they can. But um, you know, he's still real important for us. Uh, you know, he's an outstanding defender. He's a, he's a great leader in our group, and uh, yeah, he's still um, contributing. And just finally, for me, that after the Brighton game, the kind of Spursy tag was was doing the rounds, and and there was a stat about Tottenham taking the lead, taking a two goal lead ten times in the Premier League year, and, and letting it slip. Is that something that the players just have to 
embrace or is it better to block that type of stuff out? Mate, it, it's irrelevant. Who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. I mean, you say it's 10 times. Well, it hasn't been 10 times with me, so give me a break. But like, let me get the 10 and then start putting tags on me. But that's you, – you've got to accept that, right? You've got to just say, well, this, that's how – you know, people – will always find easy kind of ways to, you know, you've got a wound to stick their finger in that wound. So that's, you know, if, you, if you're not prepared to, to accept that when things haven't gone well, well, you know, make sure things go well. You know, there's one way to change that. So, you know, if, if we want to change the perception of ourselves, then it's not going to come because, oh, please don't call us those names. It's going to become because we're, we're proving that we're a team that, you know, can, can be relentless in our approach and, and, and be successful. I have one quick one from Gunway. Yeah, uh, Andrew, and uh, just a quick question. How about the Sony? Sony, is it, is it available to fly tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, no, Sony's good. He's um, he's worked hard these two weeks. Obviously, he was um, very disappointed to, to miss uh, playing for his national team, but I think it's it's been good for him these two weeks. He's worked really hard. He's had a good, good solid training week, and, um, yeah, he can't wait to get back out there. He's good to go.